Good morning. The event invitation said that this would be an occasion to go away, inspired be to move beyond bar charts and box plots. I'm afraid I'm going to give you bar charts and box plots, <laughs> but with a twist. So, this is a story about a microbiome study. In a microbiome study, well, human, micro this type anyhow, you start with a stool sample, teeming with microbes. You take a sample, you extract a small piece of DNA, a small fragment of a gene that's not found in humans. This gene fragment is sequenced, and that gives you lots of data. The data sequences are grouped into near identical clusters, and each cluster represents a unique microbe. So the final data accounts of how many of each type of microbe was present in those small scoops of faeces and the taxonomy of the bacteria they represent. It's a sample of the human... I didn't touch it. <laughs> it's a sample of the human colon, which, as you can see, is estimated to contain anything between 500 or 3,000 bacterial species. So it's quite an... Depending on how you define a species and how you count them. So it's quite an unknown um, domain. They're usually dominated by just one or two species, with a lot of variations in the small counts, and how important that is, is also a bit unknown. So, taxonomy. It's an important part of the field, and it's more dynamic than you might think. Uh, so, we're focusing on bacteria, and in the, bac the bacteria are divided into phyla. Um, we detect 10 or 12 or so different phyla in the the across the samples. Uh, if we look at just one phyla, you number of... This is going without me touching it. Classes. Um, the class Crustidia is dominated by a single order. And then in that, there's multiple families, multiple genera. It took me a while to learn that the plural of genus is genera. Um, and we can't usually tell the species. Having started off telling you it's about bacterial species, Actually, the technique we're using, um, only a quarter or so of the time lets you know the species. Most of the time, if you're lucky, you know the genus, and sometimes you don't know less than that. Order is actually the lowest rank at which almost all your samples are labelled. There's no current standard way to visualise taxonomy in microbiome studies. This is the standard output, or example of the standard output from the, the main tool I use, and it produces one of these for each rank from phylum to genus. Um, this one is order. The x-axis is 72 different samples. There's a bar for each one. The y-axis shows the proportion of that sample that uh, comes from each order in this key, this colour key. Uh, you can see that this is completely unusable. Um, <laughs> there are 32, 31 different elements in here. There's only 29 colours, so when you get to the bottom, they're recycling them. And as I said, the, even at order, not quite everything is labelled. One of the colours is for class clostridia, unknown order. Um, this is more the sort of thing people actually use, produce for, for communicating to other people. This is a, a recent journal paper that I happen to be looking at. Um, and where the visual summary is given, it tends to be at a single rank. So this is genus. Um, and it's common to give a bar chart or a pie chart. And you'll notice... So, sorry, I need... So this one, the, the x-axis is five samples. Um, this one is a different technique, so it's, it's what looks so different. And again, the y-axis is the proportion of the sample, the relative abundance. You'll notice that all the bars come up to 100%. Um, that's because they're proportions of the assigned, all the species, that, sequences that were assigned to a genus. There's actually more than 20% of their samples 
were, were unknown family, let alone genus. So, oh. Our study. We had six volunteers collect camp samples of their stool. It was a quality control and method study, so they're just healthy volunteers um, and wanting to compare, yeah, wanting to get things running and compare the, the storage and processing methods of the samples. <coughs> so we were interested in what bacteria are in the different samples, in what pr proportions. We're interested in individual characteristics, daily variability, and the effect of the method. This is a summary of the 72 samples at the order level. X-axis is the name of the order. Oops. 29 orders present. And Y-axis is a bit eccentric. It is the log base 10 of the relative abundance. Um, and the fill colour is the phylum. So the next the top level thing. Um, log base 10 of abundance is a little hard to get your head around, but it's lovely for seeing the small samples and what a long tail there is. But it does mean when you look at it, you don't easily understand what you're seeing. So because, um, say, for example, the bacteria dales in the phylum Bacteridetes, this is actually a range from 20% to 90%. Um, in this, you can see how do I um, that it's dominated by two orders, and it, so each bar is 72 samples. With I don't know if you're familiar with these, but the, the size from one end to another indicates the range of values. Okay, so my aim was to communicate an image of each sample at the genus level as well as the common problem in data visualisation of having small categories, genera is present in small proportions. As I said, in microbiome analysis, lots of things are incompletely labelled. And we had in our samples 117 different genus level categories, of which 66 were assigned to a particular genus. Um, so half of the top 10 um, micro microbes, so to speak, we didn't know the genus. So I didn't... I wanted to do this level without expecting the viewer to remember the taxonomy of each genus, without having 120 colours, without having a quarter of the bar um, unknown. So this is what I came up with. There is a panel for each of the six volunteers. Again, X-axes are samples but they're easier to see because we've split them up into people. Um, and they're the th three days and four different collection methods. So there's four for, day one, four for day one, four for day two, four for day three. Um, and the y-axis is the, the conventional proportional abundance, not log scale this time. <laughs> uh, the same colours as I used in the box and whiskers. Red for Bacteridetes, blue for Firmicutes, green for Proteobacteria. Um, so you can see again that red plus blue is around 80% or more of each sample. Um, but you can see clear, stable differences between individuals, and you can see some individual structure at the genus level. Um, for example, person 11 has no, uh, what was I looking at, Prevotella this pinky colour, whereas person 44 has a significant amount of that Prevotella, which you can only see if you draw a, a genus level plot. Um, you might notice that I said I didn't want to have any colours that weren't visible in the bar plots, and I've got Acomancia here in yellow. Um, that's because there were two different data sets and I wanted a common key between them. So. Um, Acomancia was significant in the other data set. Um, the research quest one of the research questions was, what is the effect of the method? And this helps us get a first look and formulate hypotheses. No, that's good. Um, for example, if you look at 
particularly... Oh. Person 44, you might say, oh, look, the A is... The red bar is up on each A. Is storage method A increasing the proportion of firmicutes? And then you can do a statistical test to say, uh, actually, it's not when you combine all the people. But it's worth looking at. So the design decisions for making the plot, colour by phylum, so that similar genera have similar colours. Um, because to the top two phyla had, were each dominated by a single order, I've named that order in the key. Um, and in the, the shade about family, for example, in the family Lachnosporaceae, um, there were multiple gena, genera at smaller proportions than the, the dominant one, the Blautia, and data points labelled family Sporacea genus unknown, so I included a shade for that significant family. Um, so data visualisation, it was supposed to be how we did it. I did it in R using the library, uh, libraries, where's my pointer, ggplot and R colour brewer. So anybody who's worked in R will know ggplot, I should think. Um, I'm full of praise for R colour brewer. Um, it's a, it's palettes originally de developed by a woman called Cynthia Brewer for mapping and then somebody's bundled them up into a really nice R library. In the, um, the maximum length of a qualitative or diverging palette is nine colours, and in some of my plots I have more than nine phyla, so I've actually made my own palette, stitching together the supplied palette one, and then black, and then palette pastel, so that I could have a nice long palette, and I swapped some of the colours around. Um, and then, because of the two data sets and needing consistent things, I've hard-coded the, the genera. And they have this nice feature, brewer.pal, number, palette name, which gives you that many colours evenly spaced through that palette. So brewer.pal, five reds, gives you five shades of red. Um, but when I printed them, the palest one looks white on the page. So what I've done each time is uh, oops, selected one more than I was wanting and then subsetted it to drop number one. And I've shuffled them to make alternating shades so that instead of going pale red to dark red, I've, um, I've rearranged the order so that the shades alternate. Um, and I was told that I should mention that I've used facet wrap to get the nice layout of people, which is a, a very nice little um, part of the ggplot package. And um, thanks particularly to Tony for teaching me about how to make things communicate to those deficient in colour discrimination and for the people who listen to the practices, etc., and for the entire study for the uh, stool samples. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Questions? I had a question about the, the colouring scheme at the end there. Um, how long did it take you to actually get to that point where you were happy with it? And how well would it scale if you had to deal with, say, for example, a group that was split into, say, 20 or 30 shades, or where you want to group it across 20 or 30 shades? It, it took me quite a while, an iterative process of showing my... of, of looking at them, and, um, but it would be much quicker... So that was on data set one, and then tweaking it for data set two was much quicker because I knew what I was doing. Um, you can't show 20 or 30 shades, in my opinion. Um, that is why one of the processes was subsetting the data to at least ten, at least ten percent in any sample. So I, you know, I, um, I made a list. I, 
There's I wrote a command to say, give me all the categories of which there's at least 10% in any sample. And then I sorted all my data to be in one of those or other. Uh, so that, that's sort of, um, what am I trying to say? So that's automated now. I can do that again at the press of a button. Um, but you're not going to get 20 things with which at least 10% in any one category, I hope, I think. Um, because further than that, you get a little bar of colour you can't actually see. I mean, already in this, um, this is the other data set that I just put in the corner to give an example so you can see why I included yellow, because they've got quite a bit of acomancia in some of their samples. But, you know, if this acomancia here was missing, nobody would care. You can't actually distinguish it. Yes. Uh, why are you sort of building this color palette if like, you were sort of desaturating the colors, generating those pastel colors? I didn't generate them. They're a pre built palette that's available through the color brewer, and so I just asked for pastel one. How much does that sort of break or, 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 or worsen the color line in front of this when you start to desaturate the colors? Have we got. <laughs> Anybody? Um, so this was quite a process because the colours stand out to me and I would show them to Tony and he would say, I can't see that. Um, brightness is something that you can easily tell even, saturation is something you can tell even when you can't distinguish the colours. Um, so that's why the alternating shades are really nice because you can, you can tell, tell saturation. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, yeah, 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 but can a colour line person sort of tell the difference between a sort of, you know, desaturated blue no. So that, that's why I'm sort of asking. Yeah. Um, it's sort of a follow up from the previous question um, in terms of generating many colours. Yes, so that's right. Colors. Yeah. And I think that's why the colour brewer palettes go up to maximum of nine for, I mean, you can have as many as you like for what they call um, qualitative palettes, where it's just shades, but what they call quantitative or diverging palettes, there's a limit, and I think that's based on how many they think they can realistically discriminate. Um, yeah. Then the. Uh, the stacked bar charts go up in the order of the factors, so you can use position as well as colour if you're not sure whether, you know, what this is, you can tell, well, that's the second colour from the bottom, it's, yeah. I thought you made a nice argument for looking at the, the log scale, but then when it came back to the vinyl plots, you went back to the linear scale. Do you find yourself alternating between the two, or would you like some functionality where you... Um, I, I like alternating between the two. I, f I find that um, you can really, s you know, log, log scales are great for some things, but they are, they do really de-emphasise your high. I, I actually played with and had a lot of fun playing with, but um, doing a stack bar chart with a log scale, which is quite weird because you, <laughs> you have to put, you have to make sure your large categories are on the top because large things have shrunk, and yeah. Um, but, yeah, I found having both was a really good way of communicating to say, this is our small tail, this is our actual proportions. Okay. Thank you.